What's going on, everybody? It's Patrick Dan here. So today I have a friend that I recently got to know who is the founder of an exciting gaming project, DJ Heim, that's coming up. So we're going to chat, you know, all things NFTs, NFT gaming, crypto and gaming. So all those things, we're going to dive right into it. So Milan, man, how you doing today? Hey, greetings. Thanks for having me. We're doing pretty fine. Doing pretty fine. Okay, cool. And just for the audience, you know, just so they know, like, where are you calling from? I'm based in Slovakia, which is a small country in Central Europe. I think to start things off, some of the people watching this may be hearing of Dijenheim for the first time, right? So if you were just to give like a quick explanation of what the game is and high level, like what is, what is Dijenheim? Well, imagine having the fun of playing Diablo, The Lost Ark, um, Hades, or whatever Web2 game you love playing with the ability or the possibility to actually monetize on top of or gameplay mm -hmm. by leveraging the technology of crypto and NFTs to grant and empower players by giving them true digital ownership. So instead of like only pouring money inside mm -hmm. games, just like you do in the Web 2, you might be actually able to monetize the assets you reap from the gameplay. And that's what we're trying to achieve to create something that is fun and can potentially bring a small revolution to gaming and its economies. One thing I'm curious to know uh, how you're going to answer is like, you know, there have been many like crypto games and NFT games in the past, right? And everybody allows you to like buy and sell your assets, right? NFT gaming, the idea definitely does make sense. It makes sense that you can like work hard in the game, find some good items and sell it. But the real challenge is how do you get people to actually play your game? Because there's plenty of games that are like graveyards, right? So, you know, one thing I'm curious to hear from your perspective is like your approach, right? I know we talked about this before, but like, can you talk to me a little bit about that? Like um, your approach in terms of like making a good game versus like just like launching a token, for example, right? Well, you, you, you partially <laughs> answered my question. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly that. It's, it's how you create your game. Like, like, what is the product you are giving out to the players, mm -hmm. right? Let's talk about the flaws of the, of the games on the graveyard you, men you yeah. mentioned. It's actually, why are those games there? And there's two to three major inherent flaws in their approach. The first one is that their co core gameplay is no fun at all. Mm. It's just like the main motivation for the player is to make money. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I play this game to make money and I want to optimize. I want to optimize the amount of money I do per a set period of time. Okay. This is cool up to the point where a competitor's game comes out that allows someone to earn more money. Because if your sole or main motivation is just to make money from the game, mm -hmm. the second another game comes out that makes you more money, you'll be like, okay, bye. Right? And <laughs> yeah. you leave. Yeah, move on to the next and one. And then you yeah. have extreme high churn rates and low retention and your game basically dies out because you cannot outspend low retention and high churn rates with uh, excessive user acquisition spend like that is that is a huge money sink that will kill your gaming through their projects so it, it's, mm -hmm. it's very hard to actually maintain such a situation and the second point is the inherent flaw of designing the economy just like you mentioned like pumping out a token as soon as possible like if you talk to some good game and economy designers it's like this is less than one percent of actually designing a game economy mm -hmm. in the real gaming world sure. like like serious and experienced game and monetization designers and experts and i've talked talk to multiple they're mm -hmm. actually like laughing at this like wow th this is how you create a crypto economy you pump out a pie chart of a distribution of a token and that's it like <laughs> where's the predictions where where's the progression models where's the money things where's the mid game late game scaling where's all this like knowledge where is the onboarding and ramp up phase where's the catering for whales and catering to low spending players and this is you like yeah. all the complex, like, where is it, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and hence why it fails, because if you do it this way, mm -hmm. you are hitting a very big roadblock, which is in the Web2 space. Yeah. Gaming economies of games you are playing are virtually getting optimized every single day. Yeah. And you never notice as a player. Mm -hmm. um, it's done on a high quantity of data, both qualitative and quantitative, like experts going through them and tinkering around with it to slowly patch up the economy, patch up the gameplay and bring a better and better solution every single day. But if you have the approach of like, oh, let's pump up a token first. Well, okay, then you hit the first roadblock. But once you deploy it on the blockchain, you're <laughs> uh, unless you've done a stellar job because like it's immutable you cannot change it you can't do any of the optimization that is actually being done daily in the web 2 space and oh, then what, what do you do yeah. you overcompensate with, with bringing the economy second bending it hell over your knee to like cater for this but this is unsustainable and i've been discussing this with multiple entities like multiple gaming studios mm -hmm. multiple independent people who, who work like head of game design and monetization for two independent studios one a seven figure one one a nine figure one mm -hmm. and also with some gaming investors and everybody was on the same page this is not just not sustainable it's yeah, like yeah. it makes a ton of money 
definitely we have seen that Axie Infinity, Phaeton Arena, yeah. all very successful projects, but very, very unsustainable for, about, for the long term. Mm. So our take is actually the exact opposite. Okay. You do all the grunt work, all the heavy lifting of the Web2 concepts that to this day are proving to work every single okay. day. They're like, bringing millions of players like what, and what, billions what, of dollars. What is the grunt work? What, what does that mean? Well, actually, what I mentioned, like creating a proper economy, it's, it's like creating all the mechanisms, money things, scaling. Mm. You, you, you even do like simulations. That is, that, is, that is actually what is done. That You actually do simulations like, I don't know, a half a year prediction or whatever time frame the game and economy designer chooses to do. So they okay. predict of how this economy will be performing. You also test the economy in the soft launch phase where you actually launch the economy to actual players who know that, okay, this is a soft launch. We will be losing or all our but we get to get to play the game that yada 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 maybe reaps reap some benefits that but you have actual players mm -hmm. performing inside your game uh, economy yeah. that show you tangible results of okay we might have overseen this this is performing well this is underperforming yeah. so on and so on and so on and you do all this first and once you create an economy that is like, like properly balanced mm -hmm. if possible as self-sustaining as possible and then and only then in my opinion and in opinion of others which is like a good proof of concept of mine that i thought about it properly apparently only then you consider creating a token that is there to support the economy mm -hmm. not create it mm -hmm. and i'm not t saying that this is a silver bullet because nobody has done that before yet yeah. so it's like uncharted territory yeah. but in theory what i think is that this is the maximum you can do to maximize the odds of actually creating something something sustainable, sustainable mm -hmm. for three years, five years, possibly 10 years. Got you. I have a question. So yep. when we look at games like World of Warcraft or MapleStory mm -hmm. is when I used to play a lot when I was a kid. If you think about it, they already have like currencies, like it's like gold or something like that, right? Absolutely. In a way, could those be like almost like cryptocurrencies just except that you can't like sell it for money? Like, cause, cause people have created like economies out of thin air in a game so mm -hmm. many times in like so many different games, whether it's like mm -hmm. Diablo or like whatever the case is, right? And it's really curious because it's like, People have actually succeeded in creating digital economies, but then for crypto, it seems like it always fails. Is it because they launch the token first and then they don't like build a game that people want to play and use the money? You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, let's say it this way. Was World of Warcraft first or was gold in World of Warcraft first? Oh, right? Warcraft, yeah, for sure. The game. Yeah. 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 So, so why do it the opposite way in crypto? Like, let's do the gold and, and think of World of Warcraft later. Right? That's not how it works. And yeah. imagine like every single currency there was in World of Warcraft actually was created subsequently. Like it was like you could farm like the ranks of reputation of, of with factions. Like you farm Exalted with some, I don't know, in the Burning Crusade, you, you could have formed like the Exalted ranks and then you could buy a special flying dragon like the Netherwind Drake. Mm. I, I think I even had that one. Okay. And, and it's like it's multiple currencies inside one world. It's like yeah. you had gold inside world of warcraft then you had like reputation yeah. you also had honor in the system of pvp where for example in vanilla you you use the honor to actually advance in the rank to yeah. be able to buy the pvp items like the grand marshal items etc which looking epic like mm -hmm. you have to have a product first yeah. and then you in virtually like inject those currencies it's not actually like you may even have multiple currencies inside one project yeah if they serve different ways of progression let's say just for example hades is a good example because like they had multiple soft currencies in the game it's like it's like you had some darkness which you spent on some progression on upgrading mm -hmm. your character and some unlockables in the story okay then you had gems which were purely used for upgrading your base and stuff like that yeah. some of those were cosmetic some of those were story related some of those were uh, unlocking other progressions okay then you had like ambrosia and like nectar and those you yeah. use for advancing in the progression of side character story so it's actually as for my knowledge you can have one game and have five coins going inside and each coin serving a different purpose yeah even that is in theory possible but hence you should be thinking about this in such a way that you have to have a product first mm. a functional economy first yeah and then you can think of like okay we 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 did we did this economy with gold we can work on, for example, replacing gold by our token or maybe like extending the economy by the token. There's different approaches, yeah. but none of them work unless you have an economy and the functional product. Yeah, I have another question. or It's something I observed in the NFT and crypto space. So I'll see like a project saying that they're going to launch and then they say something like, oh, we hired, you know, these tokenomics experts and whatever, whatever, right? 
But then when you look at how they launch the tokens, either like they just launch it in one go and they have a distribution pie chart, or it'll be like each NFT can produce, you know, five or 10 tokens every day. And they're going to keep making these tokens for however many of years, right? So the interesting question I have is like in those situations, even if you hire a token tokenomics expert, wouldn't like a real expert advise you not to do a token because there's no <laughs> place to spend the token? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Why would you earn a token if it has no utility? People have to realize that tokens, in my opinion, as, mm -hmm. I, as I perceive it, tokens are still only data representation. Mm -hmm. And that is that is the same with money. Like money, money doesn't have inherent value. Like you can have a $500, $100, whatever bill, yeah. right? It's a piece of paper and it's cellulose. I don't see you buying stuff with toilet paper and wiping your ass with 100s, right? It's still paper. But the difference in the, in the tangible value yeah. is the data that stands behind the representation. Mm -hmm. So the same amount of paper mm -hmm. for, I don't know, toilet paper and for a $100 bill aren't, don't have the same value because the $100 bill has actually like a data, virtual data representation. It is mm -hmm. the same with the token. And if the token can't buy you, like what is the value? Sure, Where sure. does the data representation of the value come out of yeah besides pure speculation yeah i suppose that's the issue right it's just pure speculation of like oh when our game launches you're gonna one day be able to use this to buy this but it's like that's like two years from now and if you guys survive right and that's why it's so yeah so dangerous in, in that sense right yeah and mm, especially what yeah. you what you mentioned if you have a approach like okay your nft generates this amount of token mm -hmm. and i'm not bashing and there might be people who have a grand grandiose plan with with this but imagine you put out nfts and they produce amounts of some currency mm -hmm. infinitely not infinitely like per day but every day up to infinity like that doesn't that inherently cause huge amounts of inflation and devaluation of the token like yeah. isn't it the same principle of like printing money real life money that actually causes inflation and stuff like that yeah it's the same thing so how do you even expect to succeed if you're doing the same mistakes but on steroids like you just inject all the steroids like hey let, let's not make we print the money let's make you print the money like that that is that is definitely feasible and sustainable not yeah right yeah it's fun it's hilarious though but i mean for a while like that's that was a narrative everyone's buying into well well, well it's great <laughs> for the prime movers if you're ahead of the curve you will make marvelous money sure but sure but it comes to at the at the expense that if you are making marvelous money someone will be losing marvelous money and mm. it's usually like a few people making marvelous money and yeah. a lot of people losing some amount of money yeah yeah and and and, and that's the trade-off and do you wish to bestow this upon those who are loyal to support you and yeah. grow your project like that is not the faith you should be putting them into. You should be looking into ways of how can I provide value to those who actually supported me Yeah, and not use them as exit liquidity. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I was, I was literally thinking about that today where it's like for a lot of projects, whether it's NFT or gaming or it doesn't really matter, right? A lot of times someone will have like a very big ambition, which is great, right? Because like we need people that have great ambition to like make impact. But then the problem is that whatever they sell, whether it's NFT or tokens, whatever, it's like putting all the risk on the holder. And then it's like the project has all the money. And then no matter what happens, the project wins because they just traded a token they created out of thin air for your money. So it's like, they'll be like, Oh, yeah, yeah, we have this great ambition. That's why we need all the money. But then it's like, they don't tell people what they're getting themselves into. And then people just like FOMO in, you know, what I mean, mm -hmm. it's kind of shady, because this is just like preying on the weaknesses of human psychology, like mm -hmm. the inherent flaws, which our psychology has, and is just like using all the dark, dark psychological patterns to misuse it to gain profit from people and putting all risk on that. And I, like, mm -hmm. this is also one of the big flaws of the space, in my opinion, that mm -hmm. people don't bring anything to the table, they'll, they'll be like, give us your money, we have a great idea. And sometimes somewhere somehow in the future we might not we will we might be able to do something and it's like mm -hmm. imagine telling this to an investor in the real world i'm also a tech startup co-founder and it's like you can have the greatest idea you mm -hmm. go to a venture capitalist like hey give us money we have a great idea and everybody will be like the f out of here son like bring something first show us your mvp better like show us some traction or even revenue yeah. and then we can talk yeah 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 and that's how it should be here like mm -hmm. yes the onboarding curve for mm. pro new projects to be created mm. will be higher, yeah. definitely. But that is how it should be. Yeah, that actually will elevate the space so that like less pixel mom happens. Yeah, and more good projects happen. Yeah, that yeah. you bring something, you show that I have a vision, I have some product in the making, mm -hmm. I have skin in the game, I have dedicated my time and money, putting my money where my mouth is, mm -hmm. to what I am actually building. Mm -hmm. Please, if you like what I'm doing. I'm more than happy to support you. Not like, 
I have an idea. Give me money. Yeah. And I have no obligations to actually do anything. No, I totally get what you mean. Okay, like switching switching up the conversation a little bit, right? So we kind of understand the crypto market in general, and, and like a lot of people actually don't know this kind of stuff. So it's good that you know you kind of share your experience, especially as a founder working in the space. But now let's go into Dijenheim. Obviously, you have this like philosophy of like building something first before you know like selling all these things that maybe don't have that much value. So like, can you tell me about like how you're building DJ high, like what approach you take, like where the game is at currently and when, it, when is going to be ready, like those kind of topics? Well, the approach is that very similar to what I mentioned, we are trying to enter the space and set a new standard and principle of like, okay, there are some guys who have put down their own money, their own time, they sacrifice a year of their life mm -hmm. to pursue something they deem as being worth it. Mm -hmm. And I think that should be the standard, not, not how big projects, which are like, pay a fiber artist claim you will do something in the future and fuck the rest of it like, like that's not what it's going to be mm. and that's the approach we want to make people sure like hey we're not scamming people we're here to stay our vision isn't like three months long mm -hmm. it's like my roadmap should it start tomorrow is like one and a half year long from that point mm -hmm. it's, it's like when i talk to people and someone is like oh we're here for the long term i i actually had a call and someone was like you, we're here for the long term in three months we're launching our second collection i'm like <laughs> Dude, we're probably in, in a very different ballpark of what long-term means, right? Yeah, yeah, we kind yeah. of have a very different imagination of that. And and you have to accommodate for that. So, so like, we're trying to be the angry birds of the Web3 space. Mm. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're trying to use all the experience and knowledge we have from Web2 gaming mm -hmm. and use all the principles that are working yeah. and expand on top of it by leveraging the technology. Like, look at crypto and NFTs. Sure, JPEGs are fine. And yes, we will be producing JPEGs. But mm -hmm. how about we venture beyond that? What can be done with it? Like, what is the experience we can actually give people? Because people love the experience as well. It is the same with software, with applications, with product. I have been optimizing these across multiple industries for well over 12 years. Mm -hmm. And it always comes down to the customer experience. Like, at the end of the day, whatever you are using, is it you being happy and having a delightful feeling? Or is it you wanting to throw your phone on the ground? Mm -hmm. And that is the deciding factor. And, and we're trying to do the former, not the latter. Got you. And so with, with DJ and Heim, like, what kind of experience are people getting actually, like going into the game itself when they play, like what, what can they expect, you know? Well, it's kind of a complex uh, answer okay. because like it's layered out in stages because like we're a small team mm -hmm. operation of under 20 people, which mm -hmm. is virtually considered an indie studio. But you can make remarkable stuff in, in low numbers. Mm -hmm. People tend to forget about Minecraft, which was created by one dude, right? Yeah. And it's a huge success. Who we took inspiration from was uh, Supergiant Games and what mm -hmm. they did with Hades, also like a under 20 man team, mm -hmm. minuscule budget, and they won 50 Game of the Year awards and actually been the king of the roguelite genre across multiple platforms for two years mm -hmm. and having like 700,000 paying players while they still were in open beta. Wow. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. But why did they succeed? They took concept that were working and they expanded on top of those mm -hmm. bringing a, a slight spin to the to the genre mm -hmm. and creating something really remarkable and the experience was extraordinary like mm -hmm. i i couldn't believe the success until i played the game i am mm -hmm. a player who's heavily story oriented i rarely replay games mm -hmm. i ran through that game 97 times and i was constantly reverse engineering my brain mm -hmm. because like that was what i did for years in the gaming industry of like how are they doing this like, what is it doing to my brain that I want to go have another run, go do this, try this. And, mm -hmm. and that is what the experience will be. And the roadmap mm -hmm. is la laid out in multiple steps that are designed to be the most feasible for our team size, budget and time frame. Because, yes, I could come to the space and be like, oh, we're creating the next triple <laughs> yeah. A. MMORPG. <laughs> uh, yeah, MMORPG, World of Warcraft killer. And everybody would be like, sure, man, definitely. Hence why we thought about it. Like, the first milestone we are actually releasing is very similar to what Supergiant with the Hades did. It's actually a PvE roguelite experience because mm. that is the easiest to design. You can design a, design a very good game design and progression models for a roguelite game with one person, like mm. one good game designer. It's because it usually consists some amount of RNG mm. combined with multiple game mechanics, mm. late game scaling in form of introducing extra game mechanics and prog psychological progression models yeah, but... and mathematics, like like multipliers. Real quick, as because okay. not a lot of people know the terms, right? So just so, so for people listening, I just want to let you know that for mm -hmm. Hades, it's a rogue like it's a rogue genre. Is that what it is? Is that what they? Yeah, rogue light because like there's rogue light, yeah. which is like Diablo, etc., and then yeah. there's rogue okay. light, okay. and the difference is like meta progression yeah i mean i've played it before so it's it's kind of feels like diablo but it's not mm -hmm. like a huge mmo rpg it's like basically a story starts from start to finish you run through the game and how fast can you run through a game 
for like Hades, for example? <laughs> At first, you don't run through the game. You die a lot before you do it the first time. Okay. My personal record on some high heat, which is like late game scaling, making the game harder, is like 13 minutes of a speed run. Oh, wow. I saw people doing it in six, and the world record by actually manipulating the game a bit yeah. is in four minutes. Yeah, okay. four minutes. But on average, a run, you can count something between 15 to 30 minutes. Depends on your skill and how fast you're, you're going. If you're an easygoing player, you can spend well over a half an hour just for one single run. Now multiply it by 100 and you, you might get your play time in the game. Yeah. So for people that may not be familiar with this game, it's kind of like you, you play through the game from A to Z. You're going to die a lot in the beginning. When you die, you have to start over, but you keep your powers. So then every time you keep going, you get a little bit stronger. And then eventually you get to the point where you can finish the entire game in like 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, right? So the whole point of the game is like the replayability of wanting to play it again and again and again, because you're going to have different power-ups. The monsters are stronger, so it creates a whole different dynamic. So you're playing the same game, but it's like the difficulty just scales up so much that it becomes such a different game. And for people that like that, you know, it, it just becomes funner and funner as uh, you get stronger and stronger. Is that is that a good way to look at it? Yeah, absolutely. This is exactly it. Plus, there is multiple layers, layers of RNG, which actually boost the replayability. Like the so, so what is what is RNG that, for people that um, you know ran, like like random generated stuff that is like like you you put some random things like like random allocation of rooms, random allocation of enemies. Okay. If anyone played Hearthstone, the the card you pull out next that's RNG, right? Okay. You you can say which card it is and and how your deck is aligned and how the deck of your opponent is aligned and all the stuff that happens. Mm -hmm. Everything that isn't player controlled that's RNG. Gotcha. So it's like randomly generated stuff. Yeah. And you throw in this into the formula that you actually mentioned yeah and suddenly and someone did the math there is a youtube video on that you never have actually like two same runs in your lifetime yeah even if you would be playing that for 20 years it's like virtually impossible okay so like it feels like a new game every time you start over <laughs> absolutely that's the fun part okay so dj and i kind of take inspiration from that but then the twist is like you're implementing nfts yes and this is only like the first milestone because it is the most feasible thing for us to create like like, like give people proper experience gaming experience that they can enjoy by themselves it's easily scalable you can like soft launch it public launch it scale it um do live ops on the on the game as a free-to-play game and then when you like have all this data you can optimize and properly balance out the game and then we can go to our second milestone which is actually introducing pvp and that brings me to the point of how nfts will work for those who ever played like any competitive game like, like imagine diablo or whatsoever or like even even imagine like like newer games which are like dota my league of legends whatsoever imagine nfts as being like your character is an nft your items are nfts your weapons your abilities and you can use those NFTs to kit yourself out into battle. And you might have the question like, yeah, but why would I spend money on top of it? And I'm like, okay, why are you buying Fortnite skins? Mm. Ever bought League of Legends skin? Okay. Does it give you any competitive advantage? Oh, so more cosmetics, Doesn't. right? Yeah, yeah. But you can actually do both. We will do both cosmetics and also in-game items just like that also alter your stats because that actually fuels a secondary market where value isn't based purely on speculation, but also on the fact that the item might suit your build. Because, for example, if you were a competitive player of Diablo back in the day, you wanted to have the best meta items so you would be like slashing through other players because you would just have the better items and you would have better stats and higher damage. Yeah. And that creates huge psychological motivation, both intrinsic and extrinsic once it comes to PvP. Because imagine if I introduce PvP as a second milestone where people will be like able to compete with each other, all the all the PvP stuff from all the games like, you know, battle passes or progression leaderboards. Imagine you minting a one of one NFT from any respectable collection. Okay. possibly generational wealth for multiple people sure now imagine i will give you a season-based approach where you can actually play for them now you have high motivation to have the best items to give you the proper advantage and fight because you want to end up as the number one player at the end of the season because you just might earn yourself a very valuable nft which you can monetize and that is like that caters for a lot of competitiveness in the space mm. and on top of it to cater also because like the first milestone is to cater for Casual players, PvE players. The second one is more for competitive players or casual PvP players and players in general. Mm -hmm. And then we also have a, like a high stakes mode, which is called the deathmatch mode, which is like arranged on fights, which mm -hmm. is, for example, you and me, we agree on a fight. Okay. We wager in our NFTs from Legionime, yeah. which we take into battle. Yeah. And then we have a deathmatch mode where the winner takes it all. And this is to cater for the hyper competitive players who are willing to take the risk. Because now imagine if you're a good player, you can earn potentially quite 
an amount of money by only playing the standard mode and ending up as being one of the top players at the end of the season. And you can do this every single season to reap more benefits, right? Mm -hmm. You have more rare NFTs that you can sell yeah. or do whatever you want with them. But if you do this and you're a good player, then you can like fight other people and actually win there, which yeah. is like, it gives you the potential of rapidly expanding your portfolio and hence inherently also your wealth. But also gives you the opportunity to lose your portfolio real quick too right absolutely absolutely but hence why it is only as agreed on fights it shouldn't sure. be a it's not random right yeah yeah we don't want to introduce this into common play where yeah. you, you like get matched against somebody and then someone is like fully stacked and the pro player yeah, and he demolishes you. you and you lose yeah. your stuff yeah. it should be only like hey do you want to fight me or whatever or like like you call out someone on twitter like hey hey dude I heard you were talking smack uh, that you're the number one PvP, I don't know, dual wielding <laughs> warrior, like, like want to fight for the title? And you're like, yeah, no. like, put your money where your mouth is and like, let's have the fight and you can like stream out of it. Yeah. And the beauty of the stream is it's actually like a equivalent of like Logan Paul versus Floyd Mayweather. Because, yeah. Like, were you huge into World of Warcraft? Uh, no, I wasn't. I wasn't. Oh, okay. For, for some people, whichever game you are huge on, yeah. name me two players you would wish to see them fight against each other. I want to see these guys have a 1v1. I would pay some big bucks for that. Oh, I see. I know what you mean. I can't really name two right now, but I know what you're saying. Yeah. I know what you're saying. But yeah. imagine the scenario and you could actually do like, like pay-per-view, for example, or just like streaming or whatever. And imagine the high stakes of the fact if those pro players would actually even wager in their maxed out characters. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Like that would be insane. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. High stakes for sure. Yeah. I can kind of see like how that can work in the future, but taking it back to like the beginning stages, right? Because the most challenging part games have is like onboarding new people to actually want mm -hmm. to play the game. Because without that, nothing's going to work, right? Can you like tell me about your approach? Because you mentioned that uh, Dijenheim is going to be free to play, but there also is going to be an NFT. So like, how is this all work? And like, what's the plan to like get more casual gamers inside to participate? That is a very great question, actually, because a lot of people seem to be struggling with this. And I'm kind of amazed how or why, because you don't want to make a game that is holders only. Like that is suicide. You cannot scale that. That is unscalable. Mm. Unless you like pump out collections constantly to onboard more players and unscalable, unfeasible. So you want to go free to play because like free to play has been dominating the gaming market across every single platform there is. Every single one. So not going free to play is borderline foolish and nearly suicidal. Okay. So the question is like, how do you actually onboard players? And it's like, give them the experience they want to have. Okay. And what do gamers want to have? You saw a new game or you, I don't know, you never played games and you just saw Arcane, mm -hmm. right? And you're like, now I have to try League of Legends. <laughs> now imagine you, instead of like downloading League of Legends and running it through the client, you would be like, it's a blockchain game. Yeah, a lot of friction. Ooh. And uh, opening a lot of pages. Then like, what is a wallet? How do I create it? How do I choose one? How do I keep it secure? How do I connect it? Yeah. Yada, yada, yada. And suddenly you're like, seven YouTube videos in 30 pages of documentation and you'd be like, I'm gonna go play Tetris or whatever, okay, right? Yeah. You don't want this. It's onboarding processes are being optimized everywhere. Look at TikTok, look at Instagram, like optimizing onboarding processes is a core loop of every single piece of software or experience there is, even offline experiences. Yeah, yeah. And that is what you have to do with the game. First of all, you shouldn't be differentiating between Web 2 and Web 3 players. Mm. They're all players. At the end of the day, they're all humans mm -hmm. and they all want to play, mm. right? But some are more qualified like as, as per Web 3 knowledge mm -hmm. than others, but that's just like a few extra steps. Sure. So how do you actually attract Web 2 players? By giving them a Web 2 experience. Mm. So if you want to jump into the region, I'm, go download it just like any other game and jump in and go play. Mm, that's it. Ooh, that's no it. wallet, no MetaMask, nothing? No, why? Because like nobody wants to study it. And like imagine now you're like 10 hours, 20 hours, 30 hours in the game. You love the game. It's awesome. You had fun mm -hmm. and you already ha have timely commitment. There's a lot of psychological research behind this. Once you have commitment in a emotional and timely manner, you are much more likely not to get converted, but to be subconsciously willing to convert yourself because everybody loves shopping and nobody loves being sold. To, yep, yep. Right? Mm -hmm. Now imagine you're like three hours in the game, you had a lot of fun, mm -hmm. just like you did with, I don't know, your favorite game. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you, you see a pop-up like, hey, dude, you know the three items you have are actually worth this amount of ETH currently on OpenSea, which is this amount of USD. And you'll be like, wait a minute, I can make money on top of this. And suddenly you'll be like, let's explore this Web3 thingy. Like, what is it? And now when you see the return of investment that is actually providing you value yeah you are much more likely and willing to actually convert yourself and boom 
you explore the blockchain by yourself and you have made yourself the transition from Web 2 to Web 3, willingly and in a manner that is actually enjoyable and rewarding. And that is how onboarding processes are actually in any single piece of software or experience designed. And I've been doing this for quite some amount of companies mm -hmm. and even in gaming, like I've been doing that for games who are gross, which are grossing like six to eight figures of recurring revenue. Optimizing onboarding is always this, make it as convenient and as user-friendly as possible. Mm -hmm. Introduce progression models that keep you inside the loop. So you always have the next carrot on the stick dangling in front of your face, mm -hmm. possibly multiple carrots on the stick dangling in front of your face. Mm -hmm. So you always advance one step at a time and you will succeed interesting okay so let me let me see if i got this straight for the audience as well so it's like let's say we go into the game Dijenheim, we download mm -hmm. it like every other game we play because it's fun and we enjoy it i agree that after you play a certain amount of hours in the game you there's like a commitment right it's like oh i gotta finish Absolutely. it oh i gotta get to the next thing right and then only at that stage when they are already committed and they already love the game you introduce the idea that hey that item that you have is worth you know, 0 0.05 ETH or 0 0.1 ETH or whatever the case is, right? And then that's when you actually introduce like, here's how to sell it if you want to sell it. Or if not, just play the game. Yep. And then you like even streamline the onboarding process of like, hey, I can create a streamlined process of, of how to actually onboard yourself. Mm -hmm. Boom. And now imagine giving this to a 13 year old kid that like, if you're 13, there's not much possibilities of earning money. And and it would be the dream of me being back at when I was 13. It's like, oh, if I, if I could somehow make money while playing and having fun. Mm. So now, now imagine giving them the possibility to do so, or even like players who are used to Web2. Like, like that is a marvelous experience. Yeah. To actually know that like, hey, I had fun just like in every other game. Yeah. And they're offering me money for my yeah. fun. That's cool. And it's like a win-win yeah. scenario for everyone. And you do it in a super non-intrusive way. Mm. And that is what people want to experience nobody loves excessive pop-ups or anything that is intrusive you want to do it in a pleasant way that people actually enjoy it and then you are going to win over the long term yeah i got you no that, that definitely does make sense from an onboarding perspective now one thing i'm curious to understand is like for the gaming industry not just web theory like in general gaming industry for like a more independent gaming studio is it like pretty tough to like make money like or to make it is it like all the money flows to the big companies or is it that like Hades is like a phenomenal hit, right? But mm -hmm. I'm guessing that most games aren't going to hit that level of success. Can you like maybe like educate me on like how that works? Like if you're an indie game studio, is it like hard to make it or is it? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's like like brutally hard. It also depends on the region you are in, mm -hmm. for example, whether you have good developers in the region and whether you can afford them, mm -hmm. right? Because like people don't realize that game dev is, is actually expensive. Like even creating a small-ish mobile game, it's six figures and at least four to five months of work of a dedicated team mm. and we we're talking like clones of game like, like if you have candy crush and you want yeah. to have like any clone of candy crush and there are thousands of them you better prepare some six figures and, and quite some month and a very good team mm. the bigger you go the bigger the numbers get like if you want to create something that is god of war you have to realize that they do have like 700 developers across studios sitting across the whole globe so you, they can actually work non-stop yeah and it costs like 40 millions to make right that is a totally different thing yeah yeah so yeah it is hard because it comes with a lot of overhead you have to find a very good team finding a team unless you have the connections and you haven't worked in the industry mm. it takes some time it's not just like there's <laughs> good developers sitting on their asses and good game designers because it's not only developers yeah. it's game designers it's cloud architects who handle the infrastructure part on, on how your game will be what your game will be running on mm -hmm. then it's people who do the art, do the 3D models, do the animation, do the VFX, mm. do the sound. Like, like there's a lot of stuff to be had and to be to be thought about. Mm. Like it's it's a very different thing to develop a game. Yeah. And it's a whole different thing to design a game, yeah. soft launch the game, beta test it, publish the game, scale it. There's like very different disciplines. Yeah. 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 And costs a lot of money mm. and a lot of time. It's no easy task for people who we're not in the industry because you you just can't fathom the underlying complexity behind that mm. because people think it's regarding to the question of, of, of like oh does the money flow to the big companies yes they make the big bucks mm. in the last years i have encountered a notion in the market that yeah. some people were actually getting tired of all the practices of all the like big companies mm -hmm. and we're looking towards more like A or AA games. Like, for example, look at Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. Okay. It's also made by a small-ish studio, not, not triple A, mm -hmm. but they delivered triple A graphics mm -hmm. and a good story and experience, and they were successful. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's it's like a rise that people people want to have good games. You have a lot of indie games that had a 
lot of success. I don't know, as for the roguelite genre, look at um, Binding of Isaac, for example. Okay. Also like a pixelated game and, and, and huge success. And I don't know, you have like Risk of Rain mm -hmm. or currently there's like a, <clears throat> a roguelite game like a spin-off is, is like it's some it's called vampire something something okay and and it's just like you you run around uh, the map and it's like hordes of enemies and you have a timer that you have to survive yeah and and the game has a huge success in its core yeah it's complex but if you were to compare it for example to world of warcraft it's it's extremely simple uh, so you can actually create remarkable experiences in small teams if you create a good enough gameplay loop because people confuse the fact that what keeps you inside gameplay is marvelous combat or good cinematics or i don't know uh, stellar triple a graphics mm. and like okay why isn't battlefield the new battlefield succeeding hard because they they have all of this mm. because people don't love the gameplay as much as they uh, expect it to. Can you actually explain that to me? Like a uh, gameplay loop. I actually hear this quite a bit when I watch like YouTube videos about gaming. Mm -hmm. and I try to understand it. I kind of get it, but like, what does that actually mean? Like um, for someone who is like kind of new to get the gaming industry, like why do you need a gameplay loop? Okay, well to explain it in some frank terms, it's like core gameplay loop is what you usually, like, like what is the circle? Because usually it's circular. Mm -hmm. What is the circle of what the player does? For example, let's say, you have a 3v3 arena like game, mm -hmm. um, just like I don't know, Brawl Stars, Tanks a lot or whatsoever. So you jump in, you tinker around, you, you gather resources, you fight, you gather resources, you progress through those arenas and worlds, mm. and you gather resources. There's a fragment gacha. So the core gameplay loop is actually like playing, earning resources, possibly earning those cards, upgrading, playing, and doing that over and over again. Okay. And it's usually what keeps you inside of this is some sort of progression, even if you have like, I don't know, Clash Royale or whatsoever. Okay. Like the progression is that you have those battles, but you also like, you buy new units, new buildings, you upgrade them. It's like gathering resources and spending them, mm. gathering, spending, gathering, spending, just so you have a form of progression. What keeps you inside of any gameplay loop is actual progression. And there's multiple ways of creating progression. It's like you can have a game that's just purely story and narrative driven. No combat, no, no, no action, no, no shit, no trading, purely story driven. But the progression is in the story. Good example, let's use Hades. It's a very simple game, but they introduce a lot of progression in there. You had progression in the main story. You had progression in upgrading your character. You had progression in unlocking weapons. Then you had progression in unlocking alternations of the weapons. You had progression in upgrading all those alternation. You had progression in developing your base, evolving stories with the side characters, and also main progression. And then at late the game, you have progression in the Pact of Punishment, which makes the game harder. So many levels of progression, actually, that you always have like seven carrots on a, on a stick dangling in front of your nose that you, you sometimes don't know what you want to do first. And, and that is the gameplay loop. You can create this in multiple ways, depending on the genre you are creating and depending on the experience. Like, what is the progression loop in Minecraft? Mm, I see. Well, what keeps you inside of it? Like gathering resources and spending them to build something remarkable, to have an experience. I see. So as long as there's something to keep people playing the game that makes them feel like they're advancing <clears throat> in some way. I think you mentioned you're a huge Dota player or League. Uh, Dota, Dota, right? Dota, yeah. I think we even had the conversation last yeah, time. Yeah, like, <laughs> if you play ranked, why do you play it? Because you want to advance in the ranks. You want to be like flexing, like, like yeah, I'm, I'm not a silver five, but I'm masters, whatever. And you want to have the feeling of the progression is in the fact that you have progression inside the match and outside the match. Inside the match is like level of your character, the power spike, the kills, etc., and progressing towards the base to actually like win. Yeah. And then you have progression outside of it by progressing in the ranked leaderboard, having higher elo, so the matchmaking ma matches you with better players. Mm. So you actually have a form of challenge. Yeah. You love the thrill of like, imagine suddenly being matched with all the pros you look up to. Mm. Like you would be scared, and at the same time you would be thrilled because that was an experience otherwise unobtainable. Mm. You'd be like, these are the guys I'm looking up to, like meeting your heroes, and suddenly they're on my team and they're, and they're against me, and suddenly yeah. you would be playing like a demon because that is like huge amounts of progression. Yeah, And it's, it's the same map. It's the same champions, yeah. same items, same tactics. True. Why do I keep playing it? That's true. It's progression. That's true. That's true. Actually, a lot of the like very competitive games like Counter-Strike, League of Legends, Dota, 
it's the same thing actually over and over and over the map like slightly changes every patch right yeah at the end of the day it doesn't actually matter it's, it's more like the feeling of wanting to get better or aspiring to at least right yeah no the counter strike like the inferno map it's currently also played in tournaments right yeah and inferno in counter strike was, like 1. was present in counter strike 1.6 <laughs> yeah. which is like uh, how old is it, like 20 years? I remember Counter-Strike <laughs> coming to my country when, when there was no internet, yeah, right? That's crazy. So it's, it's that old and it still stays and people play it over and over and over and over and over again yeah. every single day. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Because the, the progression in Counter-Strike is like, okay, we gather those boxes and open them and we, we have the skins yeah. and so on. But it's also like, you just want to progress in the league or in the rankings so you actually play against better players because you don't want to be like a Nova player stuck with some low-end players yeah. because like, you want to be in the global elite. Yeah. So that, that is how it, how it was called. I haven't played CS in, yeah, in, same. in years. It's been so a while for me. Yeah. yeah. Same content. It's, it's just progression among the ranks and competitiveness among players. Mm. Yeah, that definitely does make sense. Actually, one, one question I had is like, okay, I understand the gameplay loop that it's hard to make mm -hmm. a game, but you know, if you have a small team, you can do something special. Now, the other side of it is like sales or like onboarding people to actually play your game, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, from your perspective, like in today's market, especially during the free to play uh, meta, I suppose, like how are games right now, whether it's web two, probably more web two, right? Um, because those mm -hmm. are the games that people play. Like, how do they get people to get on board if especially if they have a smaller budget right because it's not like they can just spend ads and then you know make the numbers work um there has to be some way to get people interested right well to be honest i saw some huge success in people who created profitable user acquisition campaigns mm. like i saw companies who came with smaller player bases and they were like okay we can have an ad spend of i don't know 20k mm -hmm. 30k a month okay and in a few months they rose like it's not little money like for example 20k in my country that that's a lot yeah yeah like for sure 40k that's a ton yeah i have seen people working in the industry mm -hmm. creating profitable user acquisition campaigns that scaled these companies that in in a matter of months they went from spending 20 30 40k a month to spending 150k a month mm. but they were always doing it profitably that they spent i don't know 20k mm -hmm. and made 80k back in in-app purchases and in acquisition of users mm -hmm. so it's like okay we can up the budget until you have diminishing returns if you do this correctly yeah and suddenly they were spending like 150k and they were making like multiples of that back mm -hmm. this is how it's actually done it's, it's a lot of these campaigns are extremely successful uh, even I though see. i don't vibe with paid marketing yeah. i see that it's extremely successful in the space mm. so that is one thing mm -hmm. the other thing is creating utilizing streamers content creators etc mm. look at the culture like in my opinion proper marketing is getting in the space where the attention of your target audience is mm. Are they sitting on Reddit? Well, then you better be sitting on Reddit as well. Yeah. Are they on YouTube? Are they on Twitch? Are they watching Dr. Disrespect yeah. or whatever? Is it like you want to target the roguelite genre? Mm -hmm. You have seen some, for example, streamers uh, streaming roguelite games. Mm -hmm. They have huge followings and people who actually in the comments, you can analyze, okay, they are enjoying the game as well. Mm -hmm. Well, then you might be as well, instead of like paying Ninja or whatsoever, mm -hmm. you could be utilizing smaller streamers who have hyper-targeted audience mm -hmm. who love the genre you are playing mm -hmm. for a fraction of the price yeah. and suddenly you have huge exposure sure and then you just scale up yeah yeah like if you got like speed runners for example on twitch who may not be absolutely. the most popular but they might be like two thousand people that love what they do absolutely and you can create experiences like imagine you can host a tournament whoever speed runs this in the next week the fastest gets x right mm -hmm. and you can actually do this pretty easily with nfts like imagine you would be giving out nft based prizes mm. that would be very motivating instead of like I will give you a skin in the game, but I will give you a skin in the game, which is like one of five skins, right? Yeah. Which you can sell as an NFT. And then like, if you do the math, that might be some, some serious money mm -hmm. for some people. I assume that the Dota has some, some old convention skins for some characters. And those usually go in games for quite some amount of money. Now imagine having those as NFTs and you could actually sell them. Like that would be very remarkable, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I see. And that might be a huge motivation to actually like onboard players kind of we are doing because like we also like for our project we, we also released a pre-mint mini game yeah. so to replace got grind mechanics and stuff like the gameplay yeah. and we're actually organizing such a tournament yeah. among communities the space is kind of not in the most ideal state so sure. i think we should be bringing people together and people should strive rather to work together instead of competing and that mm -hmm. is what we're trying to do like let's bring communities together into a tournament where they can play like nominate players play our own game mm -hmm. and like reap rewards unprecedented like dj9 won't be a free mint yeah but now imagine that we are actually hosting a tournament for your community mm -hmm. you select your champions you manage to win and you will be winning like 100 free mints for your project in your community mm -hmm. and the partnership with dj9 and an in-game integration similar to to 
the giants like Gojira and CyberConx have. Mm, mm. Like that is some serious value. And you can actually do this. And imagine the experience. Imagine being one of the team and winning this for your project. Like you suddenly become a hero of your whole community because like you won them an amount of free mins and an in-game integration, which is cool. And you can actually do this to ramp up user acquisition and onboarding of players with a mini game like we do, with, with the main game as well. Imagine organizing a tournament early in the game with the big game as well like it just brings people together mm. and it just delivers an unprecedented experience in the space and i think that is what the space should be looking towards i see create experiences that are enjoyable for people and desirable okay so right now you know you have a nft coming up so is it like your strategy is to like kind of allow people to play the game compete in the game and like have different communities come together and like play with each other and then people that actually like the game hopefully they'll mint the nft and then in the future when you want to do like the free to play thing and onboard like regular people who may not know nfts it's more the regular marketing strategies of like hitting streamers up and, and things like that is that is that what i'm getting it's both it's yes both. okay so we're not doing it with the main game we have a separate mini game that is like oh it's different free to play browser ba browser based okay so we're doing that because like it's a it's a hyper casual side scrolling runner oh it's a, the and... different things okay got it got it yeah, 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 yeah. but the benefits you get, can reap from it uh, are the same Right. Mm. And the beauty of actually introducing the small hyper casual game is the fact that onboarding to a small hyper casual game takes seconds. Mm. Like everybody played Jetpack Joyride, Temple, yeah. Run Flappy or Bird. whatsoever. Yeah. yeah, Flappy Bird. You know the game. Like press press space bar and go as far as possible. Mm. Boom, you're onboarded. And I explained it in five seconds. Yeah. Right. Yes, it, it's to combine both because it's actually like a both a top down and a bottom up approach. Mm. It's we also like how I want to onboard people is to actually speak to them. I'm a founder that is not like sitting in some ivory tower and like commanding people like do this, do that, do that and like pointing fingers. Mm. I'm doing a lot of grunt work. Like I'm going, I'm doing a lot of AMAs. I'm showing up in communities because I think that is how it should be done. Mm. It's, it should be like people speaking to people. That is how you build communities, people having genuine interaction and not gimmicks so sure. in the web 2 gaming market for example the penetration of the asian market is extremely extremely difficult mm. it comes at a steep price mm -hmm. direct monetary price and also giving up a lot of revenue to publishers voucher vendors and all the people who gatekeep the communities and the player bases in asia mm -hmm. and it's like if you want to go to china Mm -hmm. You possibly, like, if you don't have a good connection, mm -hmm. you won't be going to China. Mm -hmm. okay. And even if you manage to, you will be talking to Tencent who take 90% of your revenue, but you will take it because the 10% is as much as the rest of the world. Yeah. Right? Now imagine what this space actually allows you to do is to speak to gaming guilds, sp speak to communities and have user acquisition for zero dollars, like really zero and not giving up revenue. And I think that the beauty of this space is that it, it takes a, a lot of power from all these gatekeeping people and it allows these new creators and smaller entities to actually emerge and do these kinds of acquisitions so yes it's you want to use every tool you have at your disposal mm -hmm. to attain success sure no i hear you and w when you say like you know access these communities for free is that just like going into like web3 communities or like any community in general right yeah yeah but you want to make make it about them do they want an AMA? Do they want, I don't know, this, that, whatever? Mm. You shouldn't be looking at it as like, I want this for them. No, you should be looking at like, what do they want? Do they want to talk to the founder and ask questions about the game so that they can better understand and decide on themselves? Like, have you ever ever talked to someone from EA or whatsoever? They don't do these approaches because they're oh, already see. huge yeah. and they don't see the potential in this. And I do, mm, right? Mm. So it's, 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 it's like you want to do this and not only for the user for the sake of user acquisitions, like, hey, you, let's get new players. It's like, you want to get the word out about your project mm -hmm. and attract people who vibe with it, who sure. like it genuinely. Sure. Because that is the best type of acquisition because it's hyper-targeted mm -hmm. and you get quality people. It's not just like pumping numbers. Yeah, It's it's pumping numbers in a smaller scale, but those numbers are of higher, higher quality because it's people who are genuinely interested. So you have higher chances of retention, which is like a very, very important metric in gaming. Yeah, I totally hear you. And then so with the NFT that you have coming up, right? Like mm -hmm. if people who are, you know, interested in that and maybe it's something that they jive with, like what what are they actually getting when they get the NFT, right? Because I probably it's not going to be just a picture. It's got to be like related to the game or like... Way beyond. Way <laughs> beyond, okay. Can you like quickly explain it just so people who are curious, they can like... Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. We created a structure that is, again, designed about the around the desires of the of the, of the the people. Okay. It's like, I can give you a, a, a an early access, but people don't like like a spinning pass or whatsoever. 
people love PFPs. Yeah. So let's give them PFPs. It's actually like a genius move because it satisfies the people. Mm -hmm. It's free brand recognition. People can rep it out just like people rep out merchandise and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's tribalism, which has been engraved in human brain and psychology since the dawn of humankind, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm a grown man and I, I own so much Star Wars that it's it's insane. Yeah. But all the time when I see new Star Wars, I'm like, buy, buy, right? Yeah. I don't need it, but I want it. Sure. It's like, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, mm -hmm. right? And that's the same thing. People people want to belong. People want to be uh, uh, like express themselves. And the PFP is actually like the, the perfect tool to do so. Mm. And how you go beyond that is the data and, and what the PFP allows you to do. So yes, you will be getting a PFP. Mm -hmm. You can wrap it out, free brand recognition, free marketing. Good. But the PFP is also like a key to early game access. The PFP mm -hmm. is also a key to multiplicative value because I... Since we're developing something like this, it's, it's huge. And to this day, it has been 100% self-funded and mm -hmm. we've turned down multiple venture uh, capital investment offers mm -hmm. because they wanted a token first. And we have already explained why that mm -hmm. is. Yeah. I didn't want to sell ourselves out mm -hmm. and neither did the team. And we know that these people actually who are believing in us and supporting us, they're helping us to co-fund the development of the project. Mm -hmm. And I think if everybody is like community first and whatsoever, and like, well, okay, how are you rewarding your community? Mm. And that is what we thought about a long time ago. Like, how do we reward these people? Mm -hmm. And I want to give these people multiplicative value. So yes, you will be minting a PFP, but the PFP is actually also an early access key to the game, mm -hmm. which allows you to get ahead of the curve, gather some resources, be more familiar with the game. Once PVP comes out, you're, all, you're already more skilled, etc. Mm -hmm. All the advantages of gameplay. Mm -hmm. But on top of it, once we introduce all the items, all the weapons, again, as NFTs, because mm -hmm. in... A lot of projects, they just dish out collections and you have the question mm -hmm. like, why, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, what is the meaning of this? And here it makes actually perfect sense that you put out new items on the blockchain as NFTs mm -hmm. because their value actually is, is from, like from day one, they have value in actual in-game integration. Mm -hmm. And the NFT, the items obviously will be mintable hence purchasable. Okay. But you as a holder of the, of, the, of the PFP, not only you have early game access, but you, for example, might be earning yourself a free airdrop of, of these items. So, for example, imagine receiving a starter pack, right? Okay. In form of a chest, just like in any other game. Okay. And the chest rarity might be strongly correlated to the rarity of your NFT. So, for example, you have a, you minted an epic mm -hmm. PFP of ours. Mm -hmm. You will get an epic chest airdrop. And the higher the rarity of the chest, the higher the possibility or prob probability, sorry, yeah. of the items yeah. inside of it being of high rarity gotcha. so suddenly you minted one pfp you yeah. got early game access on top of it you got all the being ahead of the curve you also got a starter pack and you open it and suddenly your one nft multiplied into five and for example from one epic nft you have three epic nfts two rare and one uncommon yeah and suddenly it's like wow this is getting good and the longer this goes on the higher the benefits that you will be actually reaping sure and i think that is that sure. that is the optimal way of having the possibility that you can also reward flippers because like if you buy later on yeah. well you just get the next drop right mm -hmm. but if you're the long-term holder who held it from the very beginning mm -hmm. you will be reaping the most amounts of benefits undoubtedly i got you i got you and it really depends on how popular and the demand for these nfts will be in the future Right. So it, mm -hmm. pretty much, yeah, I mean, that's the end of the day, right? At the end of the day, no matter what mechanic there is, and I think you have a pretty interesting one, it's all about the game and if people want to play, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And it, and it's also about the possibilities of what you can make with those. Not like mm -hmm. imagine those NFTs maybe later on down the future, if you're a more relevant player on the market, mm -hmm. like, like, like us becoming bigger, mm -hmm. we might be striking partnerships with, with some other companies. And suddenly, for example, there might be a thing on the table where your item or Bijanheim actually also is an item in, I don't know, Collider Craftworks or, I don't know, Mythic Protocol or wh wh whoever, right? Mm -hmm. And that might might become cool that, that actually there might be some interoperability between games one day. I, I think it's not mm -hmm. happening this year, but maybe sometimes in the future there are possibilities should the people be willing to explore those. Yeah, yeah. And now imagine being a mogul who had like 10 Bijanheim PFPs and Bijanheim starter packs, which multiplied into this quantity of items. And one day... It comes to the fact that these items not only live in Digenheim, but yeah. also in this game and that game and, and so on. And suddenly the monetization of these items 
items might become virtually insane. Of, yeah, of course, yeah, that, that definitely does make sense. So as long as the game is good, yeah, right? That's, yeah, that's, as long as the game as is, as like, the game the game is yeah, but what is what is a good game, right? Okay. I, for, I for runs don't think Candy Crush is a great game. Like, I don't like the gameplay. It's boring for me. Mm. But yeah, they're making $1.1 billion a year. So there are people who actually think it's a great game. Sure. So yeah, I guess as long as there are players in the game that enjoy the experience, and then the rest of the model does work, right? So... I hear you. I definitely hear you. Okay, so as we go ahead and wrap up our interview, is there anything you would like to leave our audience with who have listened all the way to the end, like final messages or any thoughts? No, not really. I would just like mm -hmm. wish to thank you for actually having us. It's a great honor that people are willing to talk to us and that people are taking up their time to listen to what we have to say. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm just like super thankful of you even considering to, to, to have us on the platform. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a real privilege. Thank you. Yeah, man. And thank you for your time and, and coming up and uh, sharing some of your experiences in the uh, gaming industry, because I feel like, you know, in crypto, there's not a whole lot of transparency of like how it works and what goes on. So I'm glad that you were being honest and just like sharing what your honest opinions on how you felt the industry was, um, because I think we need more of that in space. Yeah. And, and the be beauty of this is that I actually spoke to some other projects as well. Mm -hmm. Projects that other are asking is like, how are we intending to compete against each other? Mm -hmm. And nobody wants to do that. Everybody was like, yeah, let's talk to each other. Let's make the space a better place. Let's mm -hmm. educate people. Let's let's give all these information to the people for free. Like I've been even giving gaming counseling to other gaming projects for free mm. in the space mm. just in my free time because i believe that it's a it's a combined effort yeah. of multiple people that will bring the betterment of the space yeah. and i love the fact that there's a lot of other people who have the same idea and who are trying to do the same because mm. the more we educate the people yeah the more we give them the insights the less pixelmon happens yeah. and the more good projects will have funds to actually create something remarkable mm -hmm. and possibly create the next generation of awesome builders. And I would love to see that. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely with you on that, right? Okay, so thank you everybody for tuning in on the Parallax podcast. And uh, thank you, Milan, for coming through. And I'll catch you guys in the next one.